Greetings to everyone. On behalf of the Heads Consortium Board of Directors, I would like to welcome you to our 2024 Best Practices Showcase to celebrate technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Yamilet and I will be presenting the speaker for the concurrent sessions of this room. Before we begin, we request your support with the following. Please change your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruption. This session is being recorded. The presentation will be in English. Finally, our staff will pass the QR code to all participants to complete the electronic evaluation for this session before you leave the room. You can also find the QR code on your name badge. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to have. Now, we are ready to start. This current session is under track. The title of the presentation is Teaching Accessibility, a Best Practice for Increasing Equity Access and Quality in Education. The speaker's name is Rolando Mendes from the Tech Access Institution. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's not uh, it's always hard to follow a lunch or any kind of break, but uh, like she mentioned, I'm Rolando Mendes. I'm director of education for Teach Access. Uh, that's my information. However, I have some uh, business cards on me. I can share that information, and you will have the chance to uh, get the slide deck. So a little bit about what Teach Access is. We're, we're a U.S.-based nonprofit institution founded in 2016. We were founded mainly by uh, technology organizations such as Google, Microsoft, Facebook, now it's Meta, etc. And we're a co collaboration between industry, academia, government, and disability, disability advocacy groups uh, and organizations across the country. We're focused on what we call teaching accessibility, uh, although we support efforts to teach accessibly. And I will, making, I will be making the distinction between those two. And we have a mission or, or two of reaching a million students by 2030. And this recently we learned to start uh, all our presentations, all of our resources and programs are free. Usually we, we finish with that. And usually saying free at the beginning is uh, what gives people attention, start paying more attention. Everything we offer is free for faculty and for students. Sometimes we pay faculty to engage in these programs. Uh, and these resources. So here's the roadmap of what we're doing today. We are getting started right now. Uh, we're going to talk why is accessibility in tech a best practice, because we're in a best practice showcase, and why should uh, we teach accessibility to students, and what does it mean to teach accessibility, and then where do we start, and we'll have a Q&A, but feel free to stop me anytime and ask any question you might have. In terms of setting expectations, and you will see a lot of things that kind of might be uh, interesting or look interesting to you, but we try to model what we preach, uh, right? And you will see uh, that we're going to, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> by the end of this session, you should be able to explain the difference between teaching accessibly and teaching accessibility. Also understand the importance of addressing the accessibility skills gap in curricula, uh, identify opportunities for teaching accessibility in your courses if you uh, teach any, or in courses that your faculty teach, and engage college, your colleagues at your institutions in learning more about accessibility and driving curricular transformation at different levels. So you can follow along to this presentation if you like. You can scan the QR code with your phone's camera, or you can access and enter the uh, shorter URL, which is bit.ly forward slash teach access heads BPS 2024. I repeat, uh, bit.ly forward slash teach access heads BPS 2024. Getting you one chance to scan the presentation. Good to go. So, uh, we would like to frame it saying that say the word. We, there's a movement that says say, hashtag say the word, and it's okay to say the word with disability. Okay, I am from Puerto Rico. Here in Puerto Rico, we like to say special needs, functional diversity. Uh, those are euphemisms, and they're often used to minimize the experiences and live experiences of people with disabilities. So it's okay to say the word disability. Also ask questions. Uh, when we're talking about disability and accessibility, it's important to ask questions. It's important to understand different perspectives. And also keep in mind, uh, because accessibility is a very complex and uh, collaborative process, that systemic change takes a lot of time. And it takes incremental small adjust, uh, adjustment. The plus one approach by Thomas Tobin or the small step, uh, Step approach, and we can start this within our roles, and then we scale them upward and sideways. Establishing some common definitions, so we're all on the same page. When we talk about digital accessibility, we mean 
making sure that everyone, including people with disabilities, can equitably access, engage with, and participate in online spaces and activities. Uh, also, how many, how many here are from online divisions, online learning? Okay. Also, when we I mentioned teaching accessibly and teaching accessibility, when we talk about teaching accessibly, we mean making sure that the content in our courses, and the technologies in our courses, and the activities in our courses are accessible to learners with disabilities. For example, adding captions to videos, or adding alternate text to images, or using descriptive hyperlinks, and that's where most institutions in the U.S. are, because that's part of what we we should do as you know as compliance, as the law, as the right thing to do. But then there's another the thing that is teaching accessibility, which is equipping our students with the fundamental concepts and skills of accessibility, such as in a writing course, talk about ableist language, or uh, in a computer science course, talk about assistive technology. So like I mentioned, the focus uh, right now in both uh, higher education institutions is on teaching accessibility. Some institutions are starting to teach accessibility or have been teaching accessibility and we mentioned some of our partners that have been doing that but there's also a gap in accessibility knowledge and digital skills by students entering the workforce and the skills gap the in 2018 I think it was the partnership on employment and accessible technology or P conducted a survey was to better understand the accessibility skills gap and there was a big gap uh, no surprise there in 2022 we did a similar survey to follow up to see if this gap had uh, shortened a little bit, spoiler alert, it had. So we surveyed a couple of institutions and then 75% of respondents uh, said that they saw a moderate to significant increase for employees with accessibility skills in their organizations in the last five years. Also, 86% said that they anticipated a demand to increase for uh, accessibility skills, but only 2% said it was easy for their organizations to find people that had accessibility skills. And I'm guessing, uh, since you work at an uh, academic institution, probably you have one person in charge of accessibility, or maybe two. It's because we're not graduating enough people with accessibility knowledge. So let's talk a little bit about why is accessibility a best practice. Does anyone have an idea? Not everyone at the same time. <laughs> so there are various things to consider. It's always a societal perspective and according uh, to the world. Both organization, there are about a billion people in the worldwide living with a disability. I think it's one, uh, one in four adults in the U.S. have a, some kind of disability. And disability is the only group that we can enter anytime through our, our lifespan, right? And the Center for Disease Control is one in, uh, quarter of U.S. adults have a disability. Also, there's the legal perspective, what many institutions are familiar with, right? Because of the American, Accessibility, uh, American with Disabilities Act, or Section 508, or the Rehabilitation Act, or the Accessible Canada Act, if you're working uh, outside of the United States. There was recently a Dear Colleague letter uh, issued jointly by the Department of Justice and the Department of Education, and uh, in other areas, because we don't uh, graduate students just to work in our uh, states, is to work for what the European Accessibility Act was uh, recently passed, and there are additional legislations and policies, and you can access them through our uh, link. Also, it's the business case perspective because it minimizes legal risk, it drives innovation, enhances your brand, and extends market reach. In terms of quality, uh, like I said, some people here are from online learning. We have the SUNY online uh, course quality uh, review rubric, and Oscar considers accessibility across all standards. The quality matters courses on a rubric consider accessibility, and they're higher ed and K 12 standards which is standard eight, and the EST standards, if you use any of them, also emphasize that importance of educating uh, for equitable access. In terms of accreditation, we have uh, various institutions represented there, but accrediting commissions such as the WASC uh, Commission, or Higher Learning Commission, uh, or Middle States Commission, and they all have standards that are uh, associated with accessibility, with equity, and with inclusiveness, and also, Many organizations, professional uh, organizations such as ABIT for Engineering, American Computer Machinery, they are starting to incorporate uh, teaching accessibility as part of their accreditation standards. Actually, we're working with ABIT as also uh, with ACM, and we're going to be in the ACM conference this uh, next March. So we're going to do a quick pause, uh, and I'll just ask you now, what caught your attention of all the things that we have uh, discussed? 
What questions do you have, if any? The one for for Americans with disability, and the fact you mentioned that it's what we can also grow into mm -hmm. right, as as you age. And you think of one in four, and you said adults. That doesn't even include the, the K through twelve students, even though we're in higher ed. That was something to think about as a large portion of the population. And many of these are also uh, related to that. They're uh, dependent on self disclosure. And sometimes they don't self-disclose, and I think it was around 18% the last time it was surveyed across the United States, where 18% of the student population uh, self-identify as having a disability. Uh, with the different institutions that we talk, they have seen an increase in stu uh, neurodivergent students, mm -hmm. uh, and increasing that, and that's also a big concern for university students right now. Any other caught attentions, questions? Um, I think it's just interesting that uh, at the beginning you said uh, we'd be modeling what we're talking about and right after you pivoted to being like, oh, scan this QR code and follow along. I was like, you know, that could be really useful if someone has like an audio-visual processing disorder or anything like that. So I just really appreciate that. Thank you. And, and it's always like learning and, and, and uh, when you talk about accessibility, you will make mistakes and it's always trying to see how you can uh, do better every time. And part of uh, one thing that we are always conscious about is how can we include in our presentations and in our events. And this is a brain break, which is also how do you model something for neurodivergent students? Because we're getting a lot of information in these sessions. And I mean, take three breaths. One, you can take them long, you can take them short, or you can stand up, you can stay there. You know, you get you can insert these brain breaks, especially uh, when you're facilitating a one hour and a half course or when you're doing the faculty development activity and it just like gets people okay to digest what they just received and then they can continue to what's next. Sometimes they can be fun. This is like very sad. Uh, right now we need to breathe because this room is warm, right? <laughs> okay, so moving on to a roadmap, again uh, modeling just to see where we're at through that process. Uh, why should we teach accessibility to our students? We explain why is accessibility is best practice and we have different arguments because when we engage uh, in discussions with our colleagues at our institutions about accessibility, a different arguments. For some people it's a legal argument and it shouldn't be the primary one. For others it's a societal uh, argument. For others it's the quality uh, argument, most others. So, I'm going to ask another question. Consider your experience. Uh, I see some students here. I have some. Some of you are still in, uh, maybe in a, enrolling in a doctorate or a master's program. What have you learned about accessibility or disability while in school? While well, completing K-12, your bachelor's, your master's, anything? That are different, they're accessible from different perspectives about what accessibility is. We always uh, make this question, I pose this question whenever we're uh, addressing a group of faculty members, people from industry, etc. And the response that we get is almost no one has heard from or learned about disability or accessibility while they're in school. So that's why we're here. Uh, because we're trying to bridge that accessibility skills gap and we're getting more instructors uh, right now at higher level, but uh, higher education level, but we're eventually branching out into K-12 spaces because that's where students are more willing to learn. So let's well teach you trying new things. Uh, so some of the reasons that why teaching accessibility is important is because it's an essential component uh, of systems and processes in many fields. Also, it's a standard. Accessibility is a standard in some industries. It's becoming the standard in others, regardless if you work in computer science engineering, if you're working in graphic design, if you're working in health, public health, uh, business administration, education, etc. Also, assistive technologies are becoming increasingly embedded in industry, governmental service, and pri private practice. Does anyone here use a voice assistant such as Siri, Alexa? Yeah. There was initially a, an assistive technology that became uh, mainstream, right? And the things like uh, text-to-speech, that's another thing that's currently embedded in many things that we do, but even, uh, initially it was a very niche uh, assistive technology. Also, accessibility is a legal requirement and best practice, especially in many industries. Uh, some industries are requiring, we were talking to a biomedical engineering professor uh, a couple of uh, months ago. She was telling how uh, their prophecies and all of these medical equip equipments have to meet high standards for accessibility. So it's something that students from uh, biomedical engineering need to know. 
And teaching accessibility demonstrates real commitment, uh, an actionable commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right now, DEI is at the center of many discussions across the United States. In some states, they're getting rid of it. In others, it's being a hot topic. But uh, many times, when we talk to people that are involved in DEI efforts, they, we say that accessibility is the silent aim because they focus more on gender and race and, uh, and forget about people with disabilities in that equation. And also it also turns to uh, an injustice. So we talked about why is accessibility a best practice, some arguments that we can use when we engage in college, colleagues, I'm sorry, why should you teach accessibility to your students? And what does it mean, what does it mean to teach accessibility? What do I need to teach my student? So we had a couple of like, volunteers and our funders, they got together and consulted among many industry experts and they did a list or made a list of topics that they thought they were essential. What were the fundamental concepts and skills of accessibility? Don't worry, uh, if you follow the presentation, the complete document is linked there. But there are six broad categories and we're in the process of updating this document. But first, if you want to talk about accessibility, you have to teach about us disability because nothing for us without us. And you will hear that often. You will also have to talk about the side of context and historical perspectives, the models of disability that she mentioned, uh, the ADA, the legal context, the data from the World Health Organization, historical perspectives on how disability has been viewed, etc. Also, common assistive technologies, or AT, used for interface facilitators and barriers with examples. That's uh, more specifically for students that uh, do some kind of web content development or computer engineering. Best practices for product development, including agile techniques, etc., and then apply techniques in different fields. It means uh, what does it mean to know about accessibility in psychology? What does it mean into nursing or to uh, graphic design, um, instructional design, etc.? Here are uh, more topics between these six broad categories, for example, in disability. Uh, common types of disability, current demographics, understanding ability from a functional approach, the impact of disability in daily living lives, temporary, permanent, and situational limitations, and that's something that I, I encourage you to look. Uh, uh, accessibility benefits everyone, and Microsoft has done this really good infographic about showing how people can have a temporary uh, limitation or a temporary uh, disability and how it gets affected for it. Example, a mom carrying their child or, or breastfeeding her child or someone that has an arm injury but also gets benefited by accessibility. In terms of societal context and historical perspectives, uh, identity and cultural norms, accessibility as a civil right, ADA history and basic rules, Section 508 history and basic rules, legal landmark cases, there's a really good website that compiles, compiles most of the important cases in uh, academia and pending regulations and implementation, such as the European Accessibility Act, uh, the WC3 and Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which might, some of you might be familiar with. Uh, they are the most known accessibility, accessibility standards. They're not the only ones, but they're widely adopted. And in uh, higher education, they're usually used as a standard. In terms of user interface, uh, facilitators and barriers with examples, uh, accessibility design thinking, how do you manage to do usability plus accessibility, graf uh, graphical user interface, touch tactile uh, screens, gesture input, video and rich media, speech tech, speech commands, providing accessible instructions and support, training on AT and accessibility features. One thing that you can do in your courses is try to figure out how do you navigate something, a document, using a screen reader or using the screen to speech, uh, text to speech function. Another is common assistive technologies, the types such as screen reader, captioning, switchers, um, magnifiers, braille display, the evolution from specialty AT to mainstream AT. For example, we have many accessibility features in our smartphones and they're free and they're incorporated into the design. Profound impact of uh, mainstream technologies like speech recognition, language translation tools. I don't know if you saw the Apple uh, ad that recently came. Uh, a feature that came out that captured voice and tried to mimic in terms to how to create and preserve that voice. So you could read using that voice. Uh, and that was one uh, link to their accessibility for, uh, initiatives. Simple tips to get students introduced to using AT and using assistive technology. In terms of best practices for product development, uh, accessibility is a design principle and not a, uh, and not a feature. Accessibility or accessible design is part of universal design. Uh, user research and design principles, development cycle integration, 
validation and user testing, communication out, communication of like ROI, impact analysis, documentation, marketing with customer support. For example, if you work in marketing, one of the things that you might teach your students about is how to create social media messages that are accessible. When you're doing half, like this is a tip that I recommend everyone. If you're, you like doing social media posts, right? Use hashtags. Use the Camelback case, which means that capitalize each word so you can help people understand what the word is about, what the hashtag is about. Apply techniques like uh, UI elements, user interface elements and properties, semantic codes, accessibility APIs, and this is more for people that are with um, working in STEM fields, information architecture, core principles, etc. And again, I'm going to make a quick pause and get you thinking about which topics do you think you could start immediately uh, teaching in your courses or if you're not teaching a course in your faculty development activities or engaging your peers in conversation which ones do you think require more planning and for which topics do you need to learn more about so you can teach them I teach history and my first thought is to learn more about that historical context of um, disability resources and like the landmark decisions, like just even the ADA Act, you know, like and, and how that impacts. So like for me, I just want to be like, oh, more, learn more about the groundwork that um, that started this. And it's very interesting in, from the historical perspective because you might think like ADA has been along for a long time. It just turned no. 33, yeah, it's not I think, uh, last year, so it's not that old. Uh, there's a really good documentary on Netflix called Crip Camp. Uh, and it shows like uh, the experience of some students uh, attending or you, uh, you know, people attending this camp in upstate New York and these people eventually became advocates for accessibility to uh, human and a lot of other people that uh, were responsible for getting uh, ADA and other important initiatives passed. So that's one thing like the historic uh, crypt camp. And the word CRIP is being used deliberately and owned by the uh, disability community. Because, of course, you cannot use that word. You cannot see others like crazy and, right. Any others? Another suggestion for history uh, would be uh, about ableist structures. And one of our courses or programs that we have for faculty, uh, one of the discussions is about ableist, uh, ableist language and ableist structures in academia. And it's interesting seeing all the things that people come up with, like the way we assume that everyone can sit for a long period of time, and that uh, you think that if someone is standing up during a meeting, he's not paying attention, or if you're not taking breaks, you're being disrespectful, etc. The etiquettes or the way the materials are handed out, that's another way to get people to start thinking about these things. But also, you can start asking your student, what do you think accessibility looks like for uh, historian or for uh, sociologists or psychologists or public health specialists. Anyone else? Okay, let's continue. Another brain break. This is more unrelated. What does the HETS acronym stand for? Does anyone know? Yeah, it's the Education Technology. Correct. You get a notepad. You get a notepad. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone yeah. gets a notepad. <laughs> 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 it was. But you can do that as well in your courses. You can ask, like, do a pause and it's like, do like a riddle or something and have people like disconnect their brain for a while. So, where do we start? Uh, right now we talked about why is uh, teaching accessibility your best practice? Why should we teach it to our students? And what could we teach in terms of topics? But where do we start? Here are some recommendations that you can do at syllabus, course, program, and then institutional levels. For example, at syllabus level, syllabus level, you could add accessibility to the course name or description. You could include accessibility focused course goals. Also includes accessibility as a course topic. So general this, uh, discussion of accessibility. Including accessibility as an evaluation criteria for course project and assignment. A good way to teach our students about accessibility is asking to produce accessible assignments or documents. Uh, one thing that, for example, in my courses I used to teach, they had to do PowerPoint presentations, they had to make sure that their presentations were accessible. Uh, us as instructors have to make sure that our presentations are accessible. In terms of course level, you could invite guest speaker. If you don't have the knowledge of any of these topics, you can always invite uh, guest speakers to come into your classroom and talk about a specific topic. 
have someone who is a disability advocate to come into your class to talk about a specific uh, experience or talk about uh, something in particular. Uh, some, one, one of the things that we do at Teach Access is connect uh, faculty to these resources. Hey, can you get Meg from Apple to come into a class to talk about Apple's accessibility initiatives? Yeah, can you get Laura from Google uh, to talk about what they're doing to make their products more accessible? Yes, what's your course? That's the kind of things we, we do. We also create a discussion prompt related to disability and accessibility just to get them started. And so they're reading or video uh, about disability and accessibility. Organize demonstrations of assistive technologies uh, in your class. Uh, you could always, I mean, most institutions have a disability resources office. Why don't we have them come in and teach our students how to use a screen reader, or how to use uh, tactile braille, or refreshable braille display, or something like uh, all these organizers, etc. And then do like hands-on exercises such as captioning a short video, creating an accessible document or content, or evaluating a website's accessibility. There are many resources for that. Uh, we also have a list of them we can share with you. Have students research disability, accessibility related legal cases, accessible design guidelines and best practices or AT. In terms of program level, uh, you could include curricular materials, readings, videos, etc. about accessibility or from disabled authors because it's part of the uh, diversity, equity and inclusion initiative, right? To include more marginalized voices in our curriculum. So that part of that is including uh, readings or books or any other publishing uh, done by disabled authors. There's, uh, if, you go, if you use social media, follow Catarina Rivera, she's a Latina, uh, she's a disability advocate, she has, she's half Puerto Rican, half Cuban, uh, and she just published a list of uh, books about disability that she recommends reading. And it has you know, drinking, sipping, uh, sipping Dom Perignon with a uh, I can't remember the name. There's uh, a couple of, uh, uh, of books there that you can always, we always recommend The Mystifying Disability uh, by Emily Zaw, which is, gives you like an overall uh, discussion of disability, ableism, and ways to interact with people with disabilities. Promote disability and accessibility as uh, topics for research, creative design, uh, creative and design projects, integrate accessibility topics into senior design, capstone projects or working with one institution uh, to help them they, for their engineering courses. They always do an expo. They work throughout the year. So we're incorporating, uh, taking accessibility into the consideration during that project. So when they present in uh, April, uh, they have incorporated accessibility aspects into their project. Create an introductory course to disability awareness and accessibility as a program requirement or as an elective or incorporate accessibility concepts and skills across the curriculum. Of course, this is program level, it takes more time. That, that's what I said at the beginning. Systemic change takes time, so we can do small adjustment and then we can increment up with the ways. At institutional level, we can maybe create an introductory course uh, as a general education requirement uh, to, as an introduction to disability awareness and accessibility. Uh, I know MSU has a course that teaches many students about accessibility include teaching, uh, researching, and publishing about accessibility as a requirement for faculty and all reviews and for tenure. That's what, you know, further down the pipeline. Uh, incorporate uh, teaching accessibility and uh, teaching accessibility in academic, uh, academic policies and practice. I just learned about a good initiative before launch and I'm very excited to have heard that. Uh, allocate funding uh, for building accessibility knowledge uh, in faculty and students. Uh, getting to know about accessibility requires to invest in uh, accessibility learning and offer extra and co-curricular activities to increase accessibility awareness. Some of the examples from people we work with, for example, Harvard, they did a really good job at their digital accessibility policy. Uh, it was released, I think it was some uh, around the summer of last year. It's very comprehensive. They also have many resources that you can consult. Uh, of course, some of these initiatives from any institutions are because they got a lawsuit, uh, you know, that's typically how institutions react, but something good came out of it, right? Uh, and they have a good at digital accessibility policy and, and uh, also Edupos and Wanetech. I don't know if you know those two organizations. They're launching, I think it's this year, an edtech vetting rubric and has uh, accessibility considerations. So if you're considering adopting LMS or something that integrates into your LMS or one of your courses, they're 
uh, launching that bedding rubric, uh, and they're also doing it for for vendors, specific edit, ed tech vendors that they have to self-disclose how well they comply, and they give you, hey, these ones have been tested for accessibility. Uh, I mentioned in one presentation that I did early, we work a lot with California State University Northridge, and they have the Ally Plus project. It was uh, done through institutional and outside grants, and it's faculty and students working together uh, for accessibility projects. And in fact, uh, Dr. De Moon had his students from last semester participate in all our student academy and student ambassador sessions as part of the course. And they're talking about how they can incorporate having them participate in our design spring this, um, in spring, be part of the course as well, and trying to incorporate our activities as part of the course. Also, Arizona State University and the University System of Maryland, they both have uh, accessibility awareness events. Uh, uh, for example, ASU, they managed to get uh, a Global Accessibility Day in October, so they did an event for all of their employees and the University of Stemmer, Maryland. They had theirs in October as well. Some programs and resources to get started, and uh, cutting it short, for faculty and staff, we have Teach Access by Design, which is a facilitated course that introduces faculty and staff to the fundamentals of accessibility, disability, uh, and universal design. Accessible uh, Teach Access Fellowship Program, we, or 2024 cohort, is starting uh, this year. We have 20 fellows uh, from different institutions, two from Puerto Rico, uh, and they are supported throughout the year in learning about how accessibility looks like in their respective disciplines and teaching it to the students. Uh, we have the Teach Access Grants with our stipends. We award faculty stipends of uh, 1,000, 2,500, and 5,000 for them to create materials that then go into the Teach Access Curriculum Repository, which is a collection of uh, over 300 open educational resources uh, that across different disciplines that teach you, they could incorporate into your courses and teach you others. Self paced accessibility courses. We have six, uh, seven courses that are free, self paced courses on accessibility, and then we're launching four more next week. And for students, we have the Steve Checks Student Academy, which is a drop, monthly drop-in session where students get to listen from an industry expert. And the Student Ambassadors Program, which are a program led by students, for students, in which students learn how to advocate for accessibility amongst peers, to their faculty, uh, colleges, uh, campuses, eventually. And this is our last pause. Of all these strategies that we discussed, I know there were plenty of them, you will have access to them. Which ones do you think you can immediately adopt in your courses and which ones do you think would require more planning? Obviously I'm thinking uh, project, program level, institutional level takes more time, but which ones do you think could help you? Or can you immediately adopt in your courses? I'll give you a hint. One of them is inviting someone to talk to your course. It requires at least effort. Finding someone that knows and inviting them to your course. Isn't that what we all do when we don't know a topic? Anyone else? Assistive technology uh, included in the class. What else? Somewhat of, of what I've um, had. Oh, I'm sorry, Christina Arizari from Eastern Connecticut State University. Some of what I've implemented in my classes is just being um, knowledgeable of the different kind of learners. So not necessarily disability, but there's just different kinds of learning that can happen. And so not just visual, but being aware of like auditory, kinesthetic, and like the different forms of learning. Um, so I like your pause and check-ins and breaks because that helps you because you sometimes lose people. So. Yeah, yeah. And we recently learned this one about the brain breaks. We were doing a faculty and I wish I had that in my doctorate program. That would have helped. Yeah, yeah. It, would. it actually yeah. helps in digesting yeah. that information. Yeah. And also like giving that roadmap of what you're doing in your class, where you're at in that process, how long it's been. You know, it also helps students cope with the anxiety. And of course, if you're doing like, a, if anyone's teaching over Zoom, provide the agenda in advance, provide the slides in advance, always allow to report, always provide for flexibility for keeping camera on or off, asking people to introduce herself. Hi, this is Rolando speaking, because if we have someone that uh, is blind or uh, hard of, uh, is blind or has low vision, can know who's speaking, uh, etc., also helps the captioners in the room. Those are things that you can also incorporate. So. 
we're go uh, this is my part, so now do you have any questions or comments, suggestions, ponderations, etc.? So I'm in enrollment management and I'm also part of the our orientation committee and so kind of thinking about, you know, a lot of suggestions you gave were more for like faculty, but as a staff member um, who is hosting events, you know, we kind of sometimes just say, hey, if you need accommodations, let us know and just kind of cross the fingers and hope that no one does because the budget for that is, you know, we don't have that set aside. So what can we do to prepare and make sure that, you know, we're kind of in line? I mean, are any of the self-paced courses you you know you mentioned making sure your PowerPoint is accessible, website documents like how do I learn how to do that, <laughs> or do I Google it? Like what can I? Do I mean, there are different that? resources. Uh, our organization is specifically uh, focused on getting everyone have to have some basic understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other organizations that are focused on validating that knowledge and certifying that knowledge, but. If you were to know a little bit more, I would recommend uh, taking our introductory course to uh, the, uh, Disability, Accessibility, and Universal Design. The three modules is self-paced and it has uh, information, many resources on that. Uh, also has activities that guide you to think about things you're doing in your practice and how can you start incorporating. For example, there's an activity on how can you support neurodivergent learners. Uh, and there are some strategies, for example, and that's one of the things that you discuss. You can provide slides in advance, you can create an agenda, you can incorporate breaks, uh, bio breaks into like a one hour session, etc. You can let people, let them know that they can stand up or go anytime, it's not something disrespectful. Uh, one of the things in terms of like asking always, uh, who would recommend if you're hosting some, something over Zoom, have captions at the default, like you should. Yeah, that's easy enough. I'm more like, um, you know, if we need uh, American Sign Language, if that becomes tough to kind of organize and pay for and all of that stuff. Yeah. Asking events helps with uh, anticipating that. It's like you have to, eventually, the, the, the thing that, that's behind know every one of us knowing about accessibility is that eventually things are more accessible or we have that mindset. And we don't have to budget for that anymore because it's part of the main budget. It's not something that's on the side for events and we usually allocate a little bit. But yeah, in terms of the resources, I would recommend the introductory course. Uh, in its self paced it's open. You can enroll anytime. You can take as long as you want. But if you feel like you're a learner that uh, requires more assistance, there's also Teach Access by Design, which is a modified, facilitated version of that course. Uh, we offered it in September. Uh, based on that, we received the feedback, and we shortened uh, and the work, and we shortened uh, the weeks as well. But as part of that, for example, in that course, what we did was, you know, this is 10 weeks, but you will have a catch-up week. Don't worry. We know the semester gets complicated. Eventually, you will have this week to catch up with anything that you owe. So giving those things in advance. But those two programs would be, I would say, uh, could also connect you to other opportunities out there in terms of helping you take that into consideration for organizing events and processes, et cetera. And another thing, I mean, one thing that I see, you know, in high school, they're required to get the accommodations where when they get into college, you have to request the accommodations. And, and so you, how do you identify the students and things like that? But when I was director of a remedial program, what I saw a lot was like, well, I don't want my accommodations. I want to try to do it on my own and kind of watching the students fail. Like, how do we support the students or kind of push the students to put it put in the request for the accommodations because it takes so long. So I would tell them, it's better to have it in your pocket and if you need it to use it, but it's like the stigma within themselves. You know, because you think about, you don't learn anything about uh, civility, it's like a negative connotation, so they want to hide from that. I would suggest reframing the question, how we can create classes and services that are accessible so that people don't have to disclose and they take those things into consideration. So. Embedding accessibility principles and universal design take accounts for all that, you know, and something that we like to say is accessibility is not a checklist. You can create a checklist, fine, you're complying, but it's never done. And what works for one person will not work for everyone. So you always have to evaluate, you will have to make modifications always. Uh, if you start incorporating uh, accessibility principles into everything that you're doing, the documents you're doing, the events that you're doing, the way you do sessions, the way you lay out the room, you start making those changes and probably you won't get people to disclose, but they're benefiting from it. Uh, and you really the burden of having to identify this because a lot of people with disabilities have to go all the way out to this having, you know, we have one of the students that has to disclose that she has, needs some uh, braille and et cetera, et cetera. 
And it's such a hassle for them to go through all these processes and it's like, I don't want to do this and, and it just discourages them. So in the, in the way you incorporate the uh, principles of accessibility into what you're doing from the set and when you're creating these, pro uh, these events, these processes, then you're creating that opportunity for people to engage with them more equitably. And I would suggest like thinking about uh, how you can start incorporating those things. It's interesting that you mentioned that because when I was in high school, I had um, um, accommodations in high school, and when I got to college, I didn't, I didn't need it. I was going to be fine in college, and I failed my first semester of college, and then I did it again in college. Um, didn't learn my lesson for grad school, because same thing happened in grad school, I'm good. You know, I didn't, again, um, and it looks back on like all those accommodations of extra time or note taking and things like, things like that that was necessary for me to be successful. Um, now a lot of um, educators, including myself, they give the notes now. Mm -hmm. You know, like before you would have to listen and you never knew and there was no, pra you know, so like a lot of these things have become more common practice without even realizing that to sometimes, like, and if you go think even one step further, like kind of making it so students maybe don't have to disclose because there is that stigma still placed upon it because I was the example of that, you know, um, that it might benefit them in the long run. So like I had not thought of like just go through and just automatically without just even make it. just make it because even I get something like 40 disability letters every semester from my students and so after a while now I just have every combination <laughs> under the sun. Admitted. Like for example, yeah, like when just, I used to teach I would just have like the extended time for everyone. Yeah, if that's, you need it fine, if you wouldn't need it. Yeah, but, exactly. That's that's what I do. Like if I was it was thirty minutes now, I just do unlimited like, and every assignment is open from the first day of class, so they have the entire time to work on it, so they just have to turn it submit it within 16 weeks, you know, because mm -hmm. just so I don't have, I, after all the combinations, like, to try to make it where I don't have to make an actual combination, if that makes sense. Yeah. And we we'll always have to do something because, again, one solution doesn't uh, fit, and one, it's not one size fits all. You always said there's some, always some considerations you have to take. Uh, but uh, yeah, when you incorporate that into everything you do, you're lessening those barriers, you're eliminating those barriers, and you're creating more equitable spaces for everyone, including people with disabilities. And it, it, and again, thinking about sometimes it becomes, and I'm glad you brought that out, it's, it's such a stigma attached to uh, disclosing and asking for those things that you need. They're basic for you to do something that someone else doesn't require, and that's, you know, then to the extent that we can provide those from the get-go, it's better. Yes. Okay. Regards to accessing um, principles, I think in terms of the English language learner population that most uh, schools, classrooms have in the United States, um, how can we adapt all the courses, especially the online courses, to that community? For English speakers? English language learners. Okay. There's some a movement, I don't know if you're aware of it, plain language. Have any, has anyone heard of plain language? Plain language uh, is a movement across the entire uh, globe, uh, but it's a movement to improve communication, clarify. And plain language helps people with cognitive disabilities, with learning disabilities, second language learners. Actually, uh, President Obama uh, a couple years ago passed uh, legislation or an act that require all governmental documents to be in plain language. And if you go to some agencies, you will see like the, you know, all of the technical, and then there's like a plain language box that says, this means this. Uh, so plain language is always a good practice. It doesn't mean that you're watering the information, doesn't mean that you're lowering the complexity, it's just you're using, you're eliminating linguistic barriers. And it helps a lot people that are second language learners. And, uh, it's, it's a very good, uh, if for example, one of the principles of plain language is writing always in active voice and simple sentences and uh, we have been hearing a lot of uh, sessions on ChatGPT and use of AI. If you use ChatGPT and you think you could clarify things, it's like, hey, ChatGPT, could you break down this or write this in plain language? And then you can see that difference of how it turns like a very robust description to something that's very understandable. And that's very good for descriptions when you're doing instructions and uh, plain language is, 
I, I'm a believer of plain language. We like to and sound smart. <laughs> what? So we like to sound smart. I can only, we like to show off how much we learn, <laughs> we learn, we learn, you know, <laughs> years in school, but at the end of the day, education is a communicational process, mm -hmm. and you will know if the, you know, the recipient learned what you, <laughs> what you intended to communicate, so plain language helps with that, and specifically when there's language barriers. I have one minute left. Uh, here are some takeaways. I won't go into them, right, because you have you will have access to this presentation. Uh, I want to take a, any additional questions that you might have. Sorry, no fast scrolling because that is not a good practice. Any other questions, comments? In terms of uh, communicating through images instead of uh, words. What kind of uh, resources do you might find to use icons in terms of, instead of, uh, let's say, a home, and then you, you put on the picture, and thinking of autistic uh, students? Icons and uh, photographies are good op additional options. You should, you, I wouldn't recommend relying on one or the other, because there's always some preferences. And some icons or images might not be as universal as what we might think. So it would be like, this is the house for home, and home take you there, and give you like that option. Uh, and try to think that are not as, I'm trying to think of one, I think I have resources. I can give you my contact card, and I can look them up about the use of icons and images. Uh, but I know that the students that are on the autistic uh, autism spectrum, sometimes they like to communicate through images, and you will see that companies have done like, you know, the menus with images so they can interact and communicate. Other people that have like speech disabilities, they also have used them, so. Okay. But if you reach out, I'll look into it and I'll get you provided more. So a good practice to include both. My contact information is there. I also have my business card with me and I'm happy to talk to any of you after the session. Thank you very much. Business card. Business card. Thank you for your presentation in this session and for sharing your feedback. Your recommendations are very important to us. I invite you to participate in further sessions. Use the QR code in your name dash to view the program and select the topic of interest. Also, we invite you to visit HEADS website on HEADS.org to see our upcoming events on the homepage and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram as HEADS.org and see the recordings of our events on HEADS YouTube channel. This semester, next events include the HEADS Learning Technologies Leadership Academy which is a professional development program focused on developing the next generation of leaders to serve at HSI to promote and facilitate the adoption of teaching and learning technologies. Next edition of HEADS Academy will be from March 12 to March 15 of 2024. Thank you for your time.